Okay, folks, welcome to everyone. It is fantastic to see such a large audience for a lunchtime talk. So thank you all for coming, especially our colleagues uh, from UJ. It's good to have you here, and we'll see you at UJ in an hour or two. Thank you for coming. So today we have a very special speaker to end off our, our first semester GEO talks, and that is Professor Chris Hawksworth, uh, who heralds from the UK. And it's hard to summarize his illustrious career in just a few minutes, but I'll attempt to do this as best I can. He studied at Trinity College and at Oxford, and then went on to work at several different places, including the Open University, as well as Bristol University and Oxford. Um, he's a fellow of the Royal Society in the UK, and the recipient of the Wollaston Medal, which is one of the highest awards of the Geological Society of London. And he was, was, of course, a, a lecturer at St. Andrews as well for a long time. And currently he's an emeritus professor, both at St. Andrews as well as Bristol University, where he's doing many different things, including applying isotopes to human health. But what you'll speak on today is the origin of plate tectonics, which links to a lot of his work on the evolution of the continental crust. So Chris, it's fantastic to have you here, and over to you. Thanks very much. It's great to be back. Uh, slightly worrying to get applause before you start. Lord knows what may happen afterwards. But anyway, thank you. Um, I also understand it's being recorded, and I'm not allowed to walk around, and I have to use the mouse. So we'll see how I get on. So what I want to do is just encourage some discussion about the onset of plate tectonics. Mostly what I'm interested in is what the geological record can tell us to constrain models for the onset of, of plate tectonics. And many of the people in this room know much more about the geology of the early history of the Earth that might inform that uh, much better than I do. So let's see how we go. This, for those of you who want to know where we are, is um, Ettendecker and the breakup of the, uh, South, South America and Southern Africa at the formation of the South Atlantic. But if we go then to the recognition of plate tectonics, there are lots of models, lots of geodynamic models, lots of mantle convection models, which can model plate tectonics. But what do we get from the geological record? I think question, statement one almost, and it really is increasingly becoming a statement, the fact that we can go in the geological record and recognize subduction is not the same as saying we can recognize sustainable plate tectonics. There are many ways, impacts from meteorites, plumes, where you can trigger subduction, all right? And you may well get subduction-related things in the field. But that's not the same as saying the Earth has got to a state whereby subduction is sustainable and will keep going in terms of plate tectonics globally. So it's a question of how we separate out the scale issue, which is a big issue in geology all the way through, and in particular then, recognize subduction locally. How do we put that in a global context? Can we move to the statement that the Earth has become or uh, developed plate tectonics in a sustainable way. What else can we get from the geological record? Well, one of the things is perhaps we can talk about plate rigidity in terms of how rigid the crust is and how is it behaving during deformation. We can clearly look for lateral movement with paleomag and we can recognize compressional tectonics in the field. And then more widely, we may perhaps can get to rates of crustal growth and if we have a big reduction in the, rates at we, at the rate at which the continental crust is growing, perhaps that's because we have subduction and we're simply destroying crust more efficiently than, than we otherwise might. So just an outline of the kind of things we might look at, and this is a slide from the core of the Damara, for those of you who work in that area, I've just been talking with Luke. Um, what, one of the kind of things that we have then is Lots of data from zircons, hundreds of thousands of analyses from zircons. What, are, what does the distribution of the crystallization of, ages of, of zircon ages tell us? We look briefly at whether these are global signals or not and begin to get a sense of what crustal growth curves might be. And then we're going to switch grade and go to regional studies and see what we can infer about tectonics, metamorphic conditions, maybe seismic anisotropy and geochemistry. We can then switch in terms of the composition of new continental crust. And one of the things in here is this issue of scale. Geology is really bad at changing from one scale to another. We don't, we don't do it well. It's hard to do. 
And in a way, unless we get some handle on it, it's difficult to go from the significance of regional geological studies to global models. It's great to go to West Greenland and say there was subduction of 3.6 billion years ago. Does that, what does that tell us globally? And it's this shift from the regional studies to the global picture that kind of intrigues me. And one of the ways we can, there are two ways we can do it. One is we can go from regional data sets to global data sets. And the other is we can say, help modelers come and tell us the kind of things that are going on. And can we develop global models that we might test geologically? And the shift from regional studies to the composition of new continental crust is one way of moving from a local data set to a global data set. We'll summarize the changes we see, we think, from the geological record at three billion years and discuss then whether it links to the onset of plate tectonics. Many of you see, will have seen these slides before, and there's two or three slides here of an argument that we've had already just to set the scene. There are these hundreds of thousands of zircon data. Here they're plotted age along the bottom, half new isotopes up the side, bulk earth at the value of zero for Chur. The mantle values would be up here along the top of these data sets. Now these data are all for zircons. It's worth keeping in mind that every dot, in a sense, is a granite or something similar. And what's striking but not surprising is how few samples plot along the top edge of this data array that would be where new crust would plot. So understandably, if you're dealing with high silica magmas, most of the rocks you're sampling through their zircons are, uh, are melts of pre-existing crust. And Hutton told us that in 1785, saying most of the rocks of the crust are derived from the ruins of former mountains. Expensive way to show him that he was right. <laughs> but more explicitly, of course, is that this is a miserable way to look at how new crust formed. Because most of the samples that you have from zircons are really telling you about stuff that's remelting rocks already in the crust. And the final thing to take away from this, from this slide then is this sense of if you look at the, all these zircon data as histograms, there are these peaks and troughs of ages. So these are just peaks and troughs of number of ages, of a number, a number of analyses of different ages. They're peaks and troughs apparently in the volume of granite that was around or the numbers of granite samples that were sampled and those varied from having a lot at one time, let's say at 2.7, to not very many at about 2.3. And these are global signatures. One argument has been that these are then a primary record, all right, and if you have pulses of magmatic activity, then they imply some kind of instability in the mantle, some development of mantle plumes, a sudden emplacement of lots of magma in the crust. And the other argument which we prefer is that these are actually secondary features shaped by plate tectonics and it is the record that you're left to deal with. But these peaks of ages are global and how do we best interpret them? And I put this slide in again this morning because I've just been talking to Grant about distribution that Mike Brown came up with. So this is a very similar plot of ages along the bottom, number of zircons up the side. The brown histogram is a sort of early version of the histogram of ages we've just seen. And what is striking is the peaks of these ages match up with the times of supercontinents. Now, times of supercontinents is a sort of negotiable feature to many people. It's not clear how well the old supercontinents are established. But at least there are times when there was more collision going on and more crustal thickening going on. And what's interesting is that these peaks of zircon ages are also matched by peaks in the ages of these granulite and eclogite and high pressure metamorphic rocks that Mike Brown got together and they have geothermal gradient up the side. So he has these uh, high geothermal gradient rocks in orange, these middle, if you like, geothermal gradient rocks in green, and what is striking is these cold rocks only started about 700 million years ago and they, Mike Brown would infer, date the, the onset of plate tectonics as we see it today. But the high temperature granulites clearly go all the way through at least to two or 300 million years ago. 
and how do we generate them is a matter of some discussion. But our peaks of ages, therefore, are not only peaks in ages of zircons globally, there are also peaks in ages of granulifacies metamorphic rocks that are preserved. Now, what's intrigued us, and this we have touched on before, is if you look at, if you switch from thinking about generating lots of volume of magma to whether that magma will survive in the crust for long, maybe you get a slightly different picture. So this then is about the preservation of magmas, not just their generation. And if you go to areas like continental margins, like the South, the South Americas or the North America, you clearly make huge volumes of magma. There are line upon line of striking volcanoes must be a wonderful place to make long-lived continental crust. But what is really striking is that if you go to those plate margins, the volumes of sediment that you're subducting every year is terribly close in size to the volume of magma you're making every year. So these sites along destructive plate margins destroy crust as fast as you make it. If you're of economic geology bent, the story goes that the half-life of copper porphyries in the Andes is 100 million years. So you have to get in there before they get destroyed. So as places to make long-lasting continental crust, these are not as great as we might have thought. But contrast that then, if you have collision belts, take the Alp Alpine Himalayan belt, what those do is that they preserve the final stages of subduction and the collision-based geology. And it takes, it's much more effort on behalf of geological processes, if you like, to start destroying this material as, as efficiently as you destroy material in the Andes. So it's just to leave you with the sense of, not only think of how much magma you make in different sites, but also whether it's likely to survive. And we then did, a long time ago now, this sort of very cartoon picture about how magma volumes and the chances of it being preserved might change through supercontinent cycles. And this is simply your subduction phase, your collision phase, and your breakup phase. And clearly, during subduction, we make huge amounts of magma, but we don't preserve very much of it. Once you go into collision, the amounts of subduction-related magma trapped decreases clearly, and you move magma volumes into post-collision granites, and you do breakup. But at least in the collision phase, the magma that you make has much more chance of being preserved here in red compared to the magma volumes in blue. And then when you have breakup, you're probably not making much zircon anyway, so it's not a big deal. But if you put those two sensors together of the volumes of magma through time and the preservation of magma through time, then some crude intersection of the blue and the red curves would leave you with a peak of ages preserved from magmatic records linked to collision, linked to the formation of the supercontinent cycle. And therefore, there's another way you can link peaks of ages to the times of supercontinents, because at times of collision, when the rocks that you've generated, you have more chance of preserving. So that's how we got to that position. And if we then just pause and stand back and think about how that looks before we change scale, maybe it looks something like this. So here then is a similar diagram, 4.5 billion years now on the left through to the present day. The brown is the histogram, the brown is the histogram of zircon ages we've seen before, with these peaks of ages matching up crudely at some level with the time of supercontinents. If you want to then think what that means for the zircon record, for us we would therefore have a bias in the zircon record, these peaks of ages developed because of the development of supercontinents at those times. So this record is biased by tectonic processes. If we go to older zircon records, the truth is there are not that many zircons worldwide, but also it's much harder therefore to establish whether there's a bias or not. That then is the record that we're dealing with. How then can we move forward ultimately to get to the onset of plate tectonics? And one way is to begin to consider growth curves for the evolution of the continental crust, which is basically curves about when volumes of continental crust were generated as we move from some start down here before 4 billion years to the present volume of the continental crust up here at 
So these curves of green to, bl to, green to red are various people's estimates of how the volume of coronal crust has changed with time as it has grown to its values at the present day. And initially it is to contrast two, two aspects of those uh, crustal growth curves. The green ones are both anchored in the present day record of continental crust. Uh, Alec and Russo uh, tried to assess way back in the 80s now what the distribution of rocks with different model ages might be through time, and that's their green curve. And Condi and Astor tried to assess the relative volumes of rocks generated of new crustal rocks, of juvenile crustal rocks, and how those varied through time. And those became crustal growth curves. But if you pause and stand back a bit, and we've all been a bit slow to do this perhaps, it seems to me that the chances of Archean material, let's say, as a, a relative to the amount of Phanerozoic material preserved at the present day, is really very unlikely to reflect the relative proportions of the volumes of crust that were there in the Archean to those that are there in the Phanerozoic. So this issue about how you should interpret the present day record of the crust in terms, in terms of the volumes of the crust through time is at least negotiable. And in a way, this is a similar discussion to the preservation of peaks of zircons about the nature of the record. So the curves in red all try and move away from being anchored in today's distribution of rocks of different ages to find other ways to evaluate volumes of crust that might have been there at three billion years ago but are no longer there at the present day. And Belusa et al. and Dwim et al. use zircons, Pujol et al. use uh, argon trapped in quartz, and Armstrong simply speculated way back in 1981 if the earth was hot in the beginning, you'd have made lots of magma and you had lots of crust. So that, but that was hard to test. But the red curves are all curves independent of the distribution of rocks of different age at the present day. And we'll come back to them. But let's then move to regional studies and see where those take us and then get back to the big scale by the end of the talk. Here's one that has to be familiar to all of you. 1951, the president of your Geological Society of Southern Africa. This map of um, geology of Zimbabwe. Highlighting early, you know, early on what was distinctive about these Archean terrains that are not seen more recently is initially the low grade of metamorphism and secondly these, if you like, dome and basin uh, tectonic uh, domains which look different from those generated in compression zones at the present day. So that's one kind of difference you might see. And if we go to Australia where we can now look at a number of ages, what, what does it tell us? And this is initially about getting to what does the tectonic record and the magmatic record of the crust tell us about the nature of the crust at different times. The pillar itself has dome and basins like Zimbabwe or like the Barberton. And the dome and basin structures here are meant to be uh, dated of being before 3.1 billion years. And then gradually you have a change. And if you go down to the Yilgarn, where you have dome and basin structures up in the top northwest corner, but by the late Archean you have these north-south belts, which are really you know, a sign of compressional tectonics as belts are accreted along the eastern side of the Yilgarn from about 2.8, 2.9 billion years ago. So there's a change from, if you like, vertical tectonics, as you might infer from this, to more compressional tectonics from these linear belts. And after that, the crust is brittle enough to have dikes at 2.4 billion years ago. So we can go from dome and base and vertical structures to linear belts to the crust being brittle enough to form dikes. That's some kind of synopsis of how things may have changed. And one should quickly say here too that the ages of these changes may be different in different places, but the nature of the change from vertical tectonics to compressional tectonics to being brittle enough to have dike swarms may be something you'd expect to take place in different parts of the world, perhaps at different times. What about metamorphism? 
here's a PT plot. Uh, pressure against temperature, most estimates for the Pilbara and the Barberton is in this box. If you're really adjacent to a magmatic body, this temperature will go up. But these are mostly relatively low pressure assemblages. What can we take from that? The weakness to me as a non metamorphic petrologist is the great joy about PTT paths is they all end up in this box. <laughs> but that may not be relevant. Surely what we need is the pressure temperature conditions recorded on the metamorphic rocks on the surface of the earth in isostatic equilibrium. So we can compare young terrains with old terrains. And if we say in the Pilbara, right, this is isostatic equilibrium, here's the metamorphic conditions, that's fine. If we go to collision zones, if we go to eroded ones, the dam or at least a thickened zone, if not a collision zone, uh, if we go to Namaqualan, if we go to Naxos, then we end up here with, a, in response to collision and thickening, high-grade metamorphic rocks being, made, re, being generated at depth and isostatic equilibrium revealing them to the surface after erosion. So if you've had crustal thickening, as in the Alps and Himalayas and the Alps down in here, when these erode to the surface, the assemblages you get in isostatic equilibrium after collision and crustal thickening will be out here at relatively high pressure but high temperature um, rather than at the end of your PTT path which will always come back here. So it's this emphasis on the grades of metamorphism you would expect for vertical tectonics in the Pilbara versus collision zone tectonics in the Alps and the Himalayas once you get those terrains to isostatic equilibrium. And maybe this then is another difference between these early vertical tectonic terrains and collision zones. In terms of the metamorphic record, we would see at the surface thereafter. Seismic anisotropy, I think we may not be able to resolve well, but this is in essence whether from seismic waves you can see fabrics in effectively the top 200 kilometers of the lithosphere. Now here is a plot from Silver and, two, and his colleagues in 2004 and in essence these lines are orientations of fabrics inferred from seismic data. And what intrigues us, all right, is there are areas where would, you would see fabrics in these seismic data that you can map into surface terrains like the Limpopo, but you can go south into the Kapval where you might infer more vertical tectonics because of do dome and basin type structures. And here you then see no fabric in the blue dots. It's hard to do in other parts of the world. You can do a little bit of this in, in Canada, but most of the rocks are not old enough and you hard to do in Australia because it's hard to resolve. But there is a sense perhaps that you can begin to look at whether there are strong fabrics developed under areas that we might infer have vertical tectonics as in um, the Pilbara, as in the Kapfal. And what's interesting of course is we had dome and basin structures here in Zimbabwe and yet there is some fabric underlying. And then you're back to this whole issue about how you resolve the age of these fabrics and that would be a whole other debate. So it's only to flag that this may be a way forward, not that it is giving us hot answers at the moment. But if we believe in areas where there's vertical tectonics, where there might be less of a, of a, a, a tectonic compressional fabric developed, and then we de believe in younger orogenic systems where you have compressional tectonics and develop strong fabrics, this may also be another way to look at it. Geochemistry, briefly. Here, here are some data plotted against age for the results of different studies, some by people in this room, which concluded either that the magmatic rocks analyzed were subduction related or they weren't, which I've called within plate. And there are two things to take away. It seems to me that in this time period from 3.8 billion years to 2.7 or whatever, if you go to different parts of the world, you will see magmatic wrecks magmatic rocks generated in different settings and why not? So the idea we should suddenly change to plate tectonics and all magmatic rocks would be suddenly subduction related 
is clearly not likely in, in the geology as we understand it. What is tantalizing that if you go to these younger terrains, in Zimbabwe we've seen the Pilbara Barberton, this within plate signal of these studies is all associated with this vertical tectonics inferred from dome and basin structures. If you go to the Pilbara, you're getting into these younger zones of more uh, linear belts. And what's tantalizing is these really old rocks at 3.8. You can do the geochemistry on these rocks, but if you go to uh, Eastern Superior, you get a subduction zone signal at 3.8 billion years, but the fabric is late Archean. So you don't have a way easily of putting the fabric of the rocks and the tectonic implications with the geochemistry of the magmatic rocks in these older terrains. So that's just where we are. But it's intriguing that in the areas where we have dome and basin, we see within plate signals. But the key is that both are generated at different parts of the world over the period 3.8 to 2.8. And then a summary diagram that Peter Kay would put together uh, recently. of the kinds of things you might infer from the geological record that would feed into this issue about how brittle the lithosphere is or how strong you think it might be. So these are data sets from the ones you can see along the top, Superior, through to India, through to China, through the Pilbara, the Ilgan, Zimbabwe. The TTG suites that you're all familiar with in green, the sort of uh, getting moving, ending up with, if you like, more potassic granites at the end, and a common narrative, the lithosphere stabilization in these different places always is marked, is often marked by the development of these more potassic granites. And many of you are now putting lithium pegmatites in there too. But anyway, the, these development of these, if you like, lithosphere stabilization, potassic granites, as he's slightly tongue in tree, are, are, are clearly of different ages in different places. And we shouldn't expect them all to be the same age. But apparently, well, they're interpreted to reflect the stabilization of old lithosphere in these different places. If you map on compressional and um, vertical de deformation, compressional deformation, again, by the time of the potassic granites in many of these places, you're starting to see evidence for compressional tectonics. And you're also starting to see lithosphere strong enough to have strong sedimentary basins developed. And finally, and most intriguing to me really of all, is dike swarms. There appear to be not much in the way of significant dike swarms older than 2.6-ish billion years old. Preserved. Is that a real marker, all right, about how strong our crust has been since then and how weak our lithosphere was before? Um, and I think it's kind of intriguing, and I've just therefore put in another slide to emphasize it, so if we conclude no, no dike swarms before 3 billion years, does that mean it's because the lithosphere is weak? If the lithosphere is that weak, were there mountains before then? Was there much in the way of significant topography? Might be a better way to put it. All right, And that matters particularly to those people who want to use sediments to sample old crust. Because if the nature of your sedimentary record in greenstone belts is sort of local, and it's only when you get real mountains, which maybe only happen when you're strong enough to make dike swarms, that you can sample bigger areas with your sediments. That's at least intriguing. But you guys know the Archean much better than me. The Archean is full of all this mafic material. All right. Ah, oh, I may need rescuing there. What have I done? Um, you, you people are much more familiar with Thank you very much. That was easy. Um, you're much more familiar with the Archean than me. Lots of mafic material in the Archean. Is this notion about no dike swarms back then real? All right. Um, or, or, is, or, is it, or is it not? But it, it is kind of intriguing and something that we'd like to follow up. So those are the case studies of stuff you can get by doing regional uh, investigations and looking at different issues. And then Peter Kay was trying to bring them together globally by highlighting that the time scales of the records on different cratons may be different, but the nature of the change from TTG through to potassic granites, as um, <coughs> people in the audience have discussed, seems to be consistent in different places, albeit at different times. 
the shift to compressional tectonics at the end of um, a period where sometimes you can see vertical tectonics seems to be consistent. The development of dike swarms at the very end and not before that seems to be consistent. Let's change scales then and go to sampling juvenile crust altogether. This is from the Damara. This is your granites and gneisses from the Damara. Damara now an eroded origin recorded in the sediments roundabout that I would probably erroneously call molasses, but anyway, sediments eroded off the mountain belt. And if you want to know what the mountain belt is, people often go to the sediments. But the issue, as we said, way back with zircons, right, is as you walk around in the upper crust, you have a record dominated by sediments and dominated by crustal melts. All rocks derive from pre-existing crust. How do we get back here to look at the nature of the material that came out of the mantle to make the new crust to see how to take that forward? So what we did with uh, Bruno Dream now a few, a few years ago was simply to say, if you are mug enough to go to the global database and look at 13,000 analyses, do you make any inference into the nature of the um, new coronal crust? Rubidium strontium ratio correlates well with silica, right on the bottom in a global database. And clearly, rubidium strontium ratios you can infer from strontium isotopes. So there's a place to start. So this isotope evolution diagram has time along the bottom, 4.5 million years to the present day, strontium isotopes on the vertical axis. And it simply gives you two examples that if you have two granites that crystallized at, say, 2.5 billion years, one had a low initial ratio and one had a high initial ratio. If you have the model age from neodymium of those granites, formally the model age is when the source of those granites came out of the mantle. It's the time that you made new crust. And the rubidium strontium ratio of that stuff that came out of the mantle then that was remelted when the granites were formed is simply the slope of the line on this plot between the initial ratio of the granite and the mantle at the time of the model age. And completely unsurprisingly, if you have a high initial ratio and the model age is all the same, you have a high RBSR ratio in the new crust of material that was generated at the time of the model age. And if you have a low initial ratio, you have a low rubidium strontium ratio estimated to be in the source of the magma that you generated, which you then analyzed. So this is a way to get back from the granites in your hand and your sediments in your hand in the upper crust to the nature of that mafic material, all right, that was generated from the mantle in the making of new crust. So that's all we did. And we compiled these 13,000 analyses of data. And we plot here that time integrated RBSR all right, between the model age and the time the granite was made, i.e. In the, in the composition that we infer to be new continental crust. And we plot it against effectively model age, the time at which the new crust was generated. And because RBSR correlates with silica, you can view this on either axis. Back in the Archean, before 3 billion, Clearly, there's lots of noise. I mean, these are very messy systems. Rocks are altered. There are lots of reasons this shouldn't work at all. But if you look at the sort of median or the maximum probability through this data set, what is striking about the red line, such as it is, is that before 3 billion, it oscillates around a rubidium strontium ratio of 0 0.03, which is effectively the rubidium strontium ratio of the mantle. And it implies, in terms of silica, that your new crust was mafic in composition, that it had whatever, 48, 49% silica. So the making of this crust did not deplete the mantle in RBSR because the liquid has the same rubidium strontium ratio as the mantle. And at three billion years or so, then there was a change. And the, comp the rubidium strontium ratio of new crust estimated from the way we've just described gradually increases with time up to about, what, 1.5 billion years. And if you want to think in terms of silica, that implies that the silica content of your new crustal material that you're generated from the mantle has increased from being basaltic at 48% silica up to proper andesite, really, 56, 57% silica, as the composition of new continental crust. And then 
then it hit a maximum and then it has decreased a bit. And we can discuss why that might be. But there seems to be a big change at 3 billion. And these are global databases, so we take them to be global signals at some level. The other step you can take this argument is that if you go to Central and South America at the present day and you plot the rubidium strontium ratio of magma, magmatic rocks on the surface versus crustal thickness, there's pretty good array. That's the diagram here on the left. And it's not surprising, right, that, that basically the thicker the continental crust, the harder magmas have to work to get through it, the more differentiated they'll become, the higher the bizarre ratios will be. And you can even get to a stage where you have this jump in RBSR, which may well be the crust has got thick enough to remelt, and these are then crustal melts. So it, it's touching its straws, but it's touching it not unreasonable straws. And if you're then brave enough to take this correlation of thickness versus RBSR to the RBSR database, then you would infer juvenile crustal thicknesses, all right, directly from RBSR, of here at 20 kilometers or less up until 3 billion years. Because its RBSR ratios were low, that's all. Formally, you should only really do it once you think subduction starting, because this is a subduction terrain. In which case, you would start here, and as RBSR increased, then from this graph, thickness would increase until you got to crustal thicknesses heading up towards 40 kilometers. So it's a way of saying what can we look for in global databases that might tell us how these things are happening. It implies relatively thin crust at the site of crust generation before 3 billion and the change in RBSR is associated with this increase in crustal thickness as you go through to 1.5 billion years ago. And if you want to take that further, then by then you're getting intermediate crust. It's lo looking like stuff you make in subduction zones. You're having the emergence of more modern style Connell crust at about 3 billion. All right, so those are the global databases. What can we bring them all together usefully? And so this diagram just tries to do that. And in a way, it's, it's messy, but it's a way just to highlight there are big shifts at 3 billion years. So this is age along the bottom and all sorts of stuff on the vertical axis, right? Gray, zone, gray areas of subduction are continental supercontinents. The brown is the zircon peaks you've seen already, which we don't see significantly go back into before 3 billion. Crustal thickness we've just seen from RBSR is this green curve, which increases at 3 billion. If you do oxygen isotopes in zircons from magmatic rocks, they begin to increase soon after 3 billion. If you do crustal reworking from hafnium in zircons, that only starts to get going post 3 billion, that you have significant amount of pre-existing crustal rocks reworked in the magmas that gave you the zircons that you then analyzed. So there are all these things that seem to change and get going at 3 billion. We've implied potassium granite start to come in here as we stabilize the lithosphere in many places, and we don't get dike swarms before 2.8, 2.6. So this is a time of big change. If we then go and take that, that's our geological data, if you like, on different scales. If we look then briefly at these crust generate, crustal growth generation models. Here's age along the bottom. Here's, for this purpose, just volume continental crust of the vertical axis. And here is <coughs> growth curves calculated from zircons, from Dream et al., from neodymium in shales, using the same way as we do zircons uh, from, from different uh, neodymium in shale databases, and from the atmosphere uh, argon data in they hope atmospheric quartz records from Puigel et al. So all these databases that are not reliant on the present distribution of rocks of a different age start to say that maybe 60 or 70 percent of the continental crust had already been generated by three billion years. So, and of course, once you have that amount of crust generated at this time, 
you clearly have some change in slope. The rate of cluster growth here is much higher, and at 3 billion, you start to flatten it off. So the other change that's happening at 3 billion is the change in the rate of crustal growth. And as we'll show in a model just briefly in a minute, if you assume crust generation rates are broadly similar through Earth history, I mean the temperature of the mantle didn't change that much, then this change in crustal growth rate may well relate to the fact that after 3 billion, plate tectonics was much more dominant and you could destroy crust much more readily and therefore your crustal growth rate is much lower. So here then is just to end up with a very simple box model. That, uh, Bruno and ourselves have been str struggling with for the last year or so I suppose. And, and on, on this slide therefore we have the two things. We have these estimates for the crustal growth curves here in green, red, and blue from the ones we've just seen. And if we say at 3 billion, we have 60 or 70% at that time, and we know the value at this time, how do we reconcile that with estimates of what the present day age distribution of juvenile crust looks like as from Condi and Astor? So this is the present day record. This is the record we thought of the rocks that were there. This implies that the amounts of crust destroyed take us from the top curve to the bottom curve. And that's what the box model does. So here's a very simple cartoon. You can do it at different time periods, but if you have a volume of crust, you go to a new time. So you've made another volume of new crust and you've destroyed some combination of both the new crust and the old crust. And you build this up through time you're anchored by 70% of the present crust volume being there at 3 billion. You're anchored by the present day volume of crust. And you're assuming a smooth variation in generation rates with time. And that takes you to kind of an interesting and not terribly well understood place. If we look at the bottom figure here in B, this time against the present, this has rates for Crust generation that we've in, that the model comes up with through here in blue, which broadly similar to mantle temperature variations if you want to think of them in that way. So no big reason that these um, that the volume of crust somehow is linked to the volume of crust that's missing in terms of crust generation rates. But if you look at the crust destruction rates. All right, then you have not much crust destruction as you're trying to grow lots of crust before 3 billion. And then you have a huge burst of destroying lots of crust uh, at, from, from 3 billion on. And then you gradually have more and more crust destroyed through time since then. So this, if you remember, you know, this was our crustal growth curve. We had 60 or 70% of crust here at that time and we're anchored at there. And this is the model curve you get in order to hit the target curve of what's left at the present day if you use these parameters. <coughs> what is striking, of course, is two things. One is you build up to here, and then you have this change in crustal growth rate. And you also have a change in the composition of the, new, of the bulk continental crust. Because before 3 billion, remember it was all low RBSR, it was mafic. After 3 billion, it got more differentiated. So you have a change in composition. And the model at the moment implies that you destroy crust very efficiently, such that you might even shrink the volume of continental crust, and then it builds up again. I don't think that's easy to test, but that's what the model throws out. And it makes help to think about that in the context of the figure on the right, which basically shows you the volume of the crust, if you like, of those different crust types. So before 3 billion, it was more mafic. And since 3 billion, it has got to be more and more intermediate in composition. And clearly, this curve is some combination of these two curves. And that may be why this apparent reduction in crustal volume takes place. The other thing to add to this is that if you look at any model for going from a stagnant lid earth with no plate tectonics 
to the end of that stagnant lead, there's a big turnover and a huge destruction of lithospheric material, which perchance may be is exactly what's inferred from the model with this development of a big burst of destruction when you start plate tectonics as a global process which is responsible for the change in crustal growth rate. So that's where it is. It's, an, that's, it's a non-unique model. All right? It's a box model seeing how we would get on. The infer inference of the present model that I'm just showing is that whatever, 1.5 times the volume of the present continental crust has been destroyed since 3 billion years. And one of the things I'm here to do is to work with Jan Kramers to see if we can see this signal back in the mantle if we look at the evolution of the mantle. So that's where the modeling's got to. And let me just summarize some of the things that maybe we've talked about. Key thing is to leave us with a sense of scale, all right? That we have regional studies, and we have global studies, and how do we link one to the other? We're encouraged, I guess, by the fact that wherever we have reasonable evidence for dome and basin structures and implied vertical tectonics, we don't get subduction rate of magnetism, if you like, we get within plate magnetism. There is this aspect that from 3.8 to 2.8, different parts of the world had subduction magnetism and other parts had within plate. And maybe that was a phase of, of transient subduction taking place before the whole thing uh, started to dominate. We start, we start to get strong regional deformation fabrics by the late Archean. We start to get dike swarms developed from 2.6. We have this striking reduction in crustal growth rate at 3 billion years. Here's the growth curve here. Up in the corner, this big change in crustal growth rate. If we don't think the mantle got terribly cold and we suddenly made lots of much less new crust, then this presumably has to be a reflection of the volumes of crust we're destroying, which is easy then to link to the development of plate tectonics becoming dominant. In pictorial terms, you might think of uh, this is from uh, Steve Foley, who was then in Mainz. Your pre-3 billion year old uh, terrain might look like this with relatively thick cr thin crust. And then gradually by 3 billion years or so, you start to thicken up and you stabilize your cratonic areas. You stabilize your lithospheric mantle as well as your um, Archean terrains. And as an aside, then, you know, Graham Pearson and his groups, people working on cratonic prototypes, the low iron prototypes that are so distinctive of the Archean lithosphere, find those easiest to generate away from the lithosphere in the oceans. They want to generate these things that you now find with your diamonds in Archean uh, terrains from kimberlite pipes. They want to generate them at hot shallow ridges and then have them swept in, which again implies lateral tectonics by about three billion years. So this then I hope is some kind of indication of of how you might put some of these things together. Scale's important. How do we rate our detailed studies to the big scale? And does this offer some of the ways forward we might consider? Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Chris. That was fantastic. Yeah. Plenty of time for questions. Yeah. Robert. Uh, crust formation is linked to melt extraction from the mantle that you can investigate by looking at the compatible press metals in the mantle derived rocks. Now you mentioned that you are going to look, you're going to look with um, yarn at, um, at the record in the mantle, but there's models that exist already from, let's say, Al Hoffman or Bart Scamber, who looked at mantle extraction through time. Now, how does your how do your concepts compare with existing mental completion models? Do they agree? Or? No, but the, what you say is all true. But the issue is whether, and this is isotope arguments, and it's lead isotopes as being more sensitive than many others, right? That if you're suddenly putting whatever, 0.8 of the present volume of the continental crust back into the mantle between 3 and 2.5 billion years, will you see it in the lead isotope evolution of the mantle? All right? So it's the putting back in rather than the taking out that becomes key. Okay? So I'm delighted that Al Hoffman et al. can take stuff out of the mantle. I'm kind of intrigued about what happens when we put crust back in. <laughs>
Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, there are two A um, ranges of modern commodity arts. Mm -hmm. All the time, the commodity formation, and then a much younger time, the 3.3 billion. Right. The melt inclusions in the 3.3 billion show a very clear hydrogen isotop isotopic signature of surface water. Mm -hmm. It's only a bucket of our subduction. Whereas in all the commodity arts, do not show the signature, mm -hmm. the signature at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, it, it's fine. I mean, I, I think these, my key question back would be, are the young commodities associated with vertical tectonics? All right, because that's the stuff we need to know from the field. All right, and in the Pilbara, obviously, they make an argument that it changes. Okay, and I don't, it's a lot, very long time since I've been to Barberton, you know, so if we could get out the tectonics associated with things that look like chemical change, it would be fantastic. If not, I'm stuck with saying transient subduction takes place. That's all fine, you know. And there's no doubt there are models to make subduction happen by impact, to make it happen by plumes, but only locally, as on Venus and other planets, right? And it's this shift to a sustainable long-term plate tectonic system that becomes key, rather than there's one smoking gun in one, in one place that has a global implication. So that's the delicate dance, which is interesting and hard to resolve. But if one could link a change in tectonics to your change in hydrogen, that would be wonderful. Yes, so this 3.3 is critical. I know, but I'm... I can see most of your current start, not a 3 billion, yeah. but a 3.3. And that, but that may be a particularly South African perspective. Okay, I mean, I think these things do start at different times in different places. Yeah, and yours is the older one. Yeah. Um, okay. Your crystal uh, recycling rates that you showed yep. going up, is that the difference between zircons that have ages very close to their model ages and zircons that are quite different in age from, from the model ages from the zircons? So does that start to spread out at, at 3 billion there? Yeah, okay. Take you back a step. It, when you're trying to draw, uh, develop a crustal growth curve from zircons, you'd you, you construct the curve exactly the way Luke's implied. You start at the present day and you do effectively a proportion of new crust to rework crust in the zircons back through time. And that gives you what you hope is the relative volume through time. And that anchors the curve, all right? But then the box model is simply saying the zircon curve exists and the present day preserve curve, the lower one exists. Can we make a box model, right, which simply talks in volumes of crustal material, all right, of whatever stuff, yeah? And the key really is that if you want to go, f the, the difference between the curves is greatest between 3 billion years and 2.5, right? So you have to destroy that stuff early or you'd still have a record of it, okay? So that's why the model seems to throw up this drastic overturn at 3 billion to 2.5. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't you agree that the, um, the degree to which we can be confident about how the Earth works globally in yeah. terms of time becomes more and more negotiable as you go back in time because yeah. the record is Awful. increasingly poor yeah. and it requires more and more of an assumption that what you see in the old rocks is what was there yeah. and there's been no selective destruction or selective preservation. So yes. that's, that's always going to compromise these kinds of, don't you think? Yeah, no, no, I'm sure that's true. Um, and one of the questions then becomes, right, is whether things like inferring the source of magmas, all right, through, through RBSR, is as sensitive to those concerns as other issues, right? Because some of those inferences about Archean are from, inferred from rocks that are younger but rework Archean material. All right, so the bias would have to extend significantly into the Proterozoic as well, yeah, um, for that to be a, such an issue for those kind of records. But in general, I absolutely agree; it's really tricky. And, and the, the reason you have low RBSR rocks in the, in the early Archean yeah. is because the high ones have been destroyed or, or re recycled. Them. So no, but if but it depends when you think they happened, right? 
Okay, this simply says that if you have a 2.8 billion year old rock that melted a crustal source, most of those crustal sources around a 2.8 or 2.7 or 2.9 were mafic. All right, so, so it depends when you're worried about the crust destruction happening took place, I think. Yeah. Okay, if there's any more burning questions, uh, just one more time. Thank you very much, Chris. Pleasure. Pleasure. This is the last geo talk for the semester, but we'll begin again in the middle of July. So we'll see you then. And don't forget talks at UJ this afternoon from 2 p.m. <laughs>